Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this Tech Strong Learning Experience brought to you by Cloud Flare. <laughs> My name is Cody, and I'm the host of Tech Strong Learning, and we have an exciting program ahead. Before we begin, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our conversation, perhaps you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend. The on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you'd like to engage with our panelists today, you can do so on the right side of the screen. Uh, the first option you'll see is the chat tab. So I'd like you to go ahead and start warming that up for us right now by letting us know from where you are joining us. If you have any questions, we'd like you to direct those to the Q&A tab, which can be found directly to the right of the chat. If you navigate over to the handouts tab, you'll see there are some additional resources that have been uploaded for you. So feel free to grab those. And of course, before we close out, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So our topic today is cash reserve, eliminating the creeping cost of egress fees. And I'm joined by Bob Khan, tech evangelist at Cloudflare, and Humer Ahmed, technical solutions architect at Cloudflare. So Babar and Humer, thank you both so much for joining me today. Babar, you wanna get us kicked off? Perfect, thank you. Um, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We're super excited to talk about this topic. Uh, I'm not gonna waste any more time. Let's just dive right into it. So let's start by looking at the agenda for today's session. We're gonna start by talking about uh, legacy storage solutions and the move to the cloud, why people are deciding to move their data and applications to the cloud, and why this trend has been becoming more and more popular over the past few years. Then we're going to talk about traditional and tiered caching, what traditional CDNs do, what do they look like, uh, and what are some of the benefits of using uh, traditional and tiered uh, CDNs and caching. Then we will talk about egress fees, which is the main topic here and why they matter and why they should matter to you and your business and why lowering those costs is more important than anything else right now in today's climate. Um, then we will talk about eliminating egress fees with cash reserve, which is the Cloudflare solution. And then finally, Homer is actually going to go through a detailed technical walkthrough of cash reserve. We will have a demo. We have a really nice program set up so let's just get started. So before we get into you know, what egress fees are, I kind of wanted to cover a little bit of the background for uh, why, you know, what are some of the key challenges when it comes to application availability and performance. Now, obviously uh, in the past couple of years with the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, what we've seen is uh, we did have this trend of uh, distributed user for, or use force, uh, uh, distributed uh, workforces across uh, the company. So uh, traditionally what we had, you would have a, a, an HQ, you would have some site offices and they would be connected. But as we moved towards 2020 or into um, you know early 2020, we did see a trend um, uh, towards you know people moving away from their traditional offices, working from home, uh, you have a lot of these people who are just moving around. One day they're uh, one day they're in Amsterdam, the other day they're in Los Angeles, for example. So you know your workforce is increasingly distributed and increasingly mobile. Now the pandemic, what that did was it made us realize that the world would actually need that to happen. Uh, when everything was closed down, everyone went remote, and that was kind of a wake up call for everyone because a lot of the organizations weren't even ready or prepared to handle some of the things that happened during the pandemic. Um, uh, so, you know, this is one of the key trends that we're seeing. It's one of the key challenges with application availability and performance with all these distributed users and the distributed workforce. We need to make sure that applications are available to all those people um, at the same performance uh, levels that they would see if they were in their headquarter connected directly to the network. Now, the second thing is costly downtimes. Now, downtimes can either be caused by technical issues uh, in your data centers, or they can be caused by, let's say, DDoS attacks, for example. So, you know, that can be a big problem. If a business goes down in today's day and age, even for a few seconds, it can cost you billions of dollars. And that's why, you know, we need to make sure that uh, these downtimes and the costs associated, associated with them are brought down as much as possible. Um, then, 
a deteriorated user experience can be extremely detrimental to your business. And on the next slide, we're going to go into some details of, of what that looks like and why that is. And then finally, uh, you know, a lot of the organizations, we know that there's a huge scale gap and the small IT teams that we do have, and these days they're just shrinking because of the economic climate that we're seeing right now. Uh, there are a lot of cost cuts, a lot of lay layoffs. And because of that, we do see smaller and smaller IT teams. And those IT teams, if they're working with uh, overly complex solutions that are distributed and you have multiple vendor solutions, they're not necessarily designed to work well with each other. They're going to have a bit of a trouble, a bit of a problem trying to streamline the overall process and making sure that everything is performant, everything is always available, and everything is reliably available. Um, now, looking at why performance matters, uh, the first thing I want to talk about here is SEO. We all know SEO and the importance of SEO for a certain business. And obviously, uh, you want to make sure that your web pages are showing on that first page at the top of the first page above the fold on Google, right? So in order to do that, obviously there are many things that you need to do, but one of the key things is if your uh, web pages are fast enough, uh, the web crawlers would get to them faster than let's say other pages, and that's how they would be better ranked and that would improve your SEO scores. Uh, the second thing is conversions. Conversions are extremely important. This is where user experience comes into play. Um, you know, there are different studies that have been conducted. One of the studies said that uh, about 2.4 per uh, 2.4 seconds is the average time uh, within which you you need to make sure that pages are uh, completely uh, you know available to your customers, to your online customers. If they if it goes beyond that, their customer satisfaction rates go way down. And then another study so, uh, says that about 50% of people, if they don't get to what they want to do on your website in those 2.4 seconds, they're just going to leave and never come back. That's you losing half of your online business. That's obviously not good. And it's going to cost you big. If you look at web performance related, um, you know, uh, costs um, that are, are you know, um, losses, uh, on average, every year, it's about $2 billion worth of sales lost because of poorly performing, slow loading websites where, you know, your retail, uh, your, your customers are just totally irritated with your websites and they will just walk away. No one wants that. And that's why, you know, coming back to the original point that I mentioned in the agenda, that's why a lot of these organizations have been moving their applications and data to the cloud. A lot of the points that I just mentioned, that is taken care of once you move towards the cloud. And uh, you know the data that your applications are dependent on, that also needs to move to the cloud so that it can be accessed faster. Um, you don't have to worry about you know, things like um, hardware updates, making sure that your data centers are running at speed and things like that. Um, now, on-premises data storage uh, solutions obviously have a lot of limitations. They give you good control over your data and your uh, servers and data centers, but at the same time, it can create a lot of problems. There can be performance bottlenecks, there can be added latency, so on and so forth. You have to make sure that your data is available in all these different geographical locations so that it can be accessed at super speeds by all of your customers, which is very hard to do. Um, so, you know, new business requirements and privacy regulations, et cetera, like GDPR and, you know, localization regu um, requirements, they are forcing people to move their data to the cloud and as close to the customer as possible. Uh, because some of the benefits that you're going to get out of uh, doing that is you, uh, with the cloud, you have a lot of flexibility. You can scale virtually uh, infinitely without really having any issues uh, because you're not really controlling uh, all you have to do is spend a little more on that, but you don't have to like uh, take care of all the background work, like you know, making sure the racks are filled with all the servers, making sure all the networks are up and running. The cloud uh, storage providers and service providers will take care of that for you. Then obviously, lower latency. The closer you are to the user, the better performance and lower latency you're going to um, have. That's an obvious benefit of moving to the cloud. Um, that's going to improve the user experience. And then the ease of management, a lot of these solutions have these single pane of glass 
solutions. Um, you know, they have really powerful APIs that they, you can just use, integrate multiple, multiple systems, and your IT staff is just going to thank you for moving to the cloud. And again, affordability. It's very affordable for going from a CapEx model to an OpEx model, making sure you're spending money only on the data and the amount of traffic that you're uh, generating and using. Now, speaking of moving data closer to the users, um, things like caching and traditional CDNs come to mind, right? Uh, the whole concept of a CDN is having multiple locations across the globe where you can have data as close to your customers as possible, making sure that the most popular data is as close to them as possible so that you don't add any additional latency. Uh, you make sure that your origins, uh, origin servers are not bombarded with uh, traffic for no reason. Um, and, you know, making sure that you have better performance, better user experience and happy customers. Now, traditional caching, uh, let's talk about traditional caching and cloud storage. Even with a lot of our customers, what we see is uh, they would have, uh, they would be using storage facilities from these public uh, cloud companies. Uh, and then they would use certain CDNs to front those cloud storage origins that they have, right? So uh, one of the things that we see, ob there's an obvious benefit when you enable a CDN, when you enable caching and tiered caching, for example, where you have multiple tiers. If you don't find uh, something in the first tier, you move to the next and look for it there. If you don't find that piece of data over there, then maybe you go to the origin. So if you have that, Obviously, you're improving the chances of finding um, whatever your, uh, your, your users are requesting in those uh, tiers of cache. But if you don't find that, then eventually you have to go to the origin server. And Homer is obviously going to go through the traffic flows for that and go into details. Now, the problem with uh, tiered caching can be, while this is a good solution for most organizations, but the, the more you grow, the more data you have, the problem you see is, these caches are based primarily on popularity. So if you have, uh, if the frequency of the use of a certain piece of data is higher than the other, it will stay in the cache, the rest will be purged out. And then, you know, you, if someone else is requesting that data, you will have cache misses and you're going to go back to the server. So obviously there are certain limitations with this. Um, and cache misses can be super expensive. That's why we're here. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. If you have a low cache hit ratio, you are going to uh, have to go back to the origin server to pick that piece of data and put it back in cache. Um, those round trips can cost you in terms of performance and adding latency. Even if it's a little bit, it's still going to add up. And you know it's going to have that little bit of an issue for your customers. And then high egress fees, that is the biggest problem here. Uh, when you have a lot of egress from your cloud storage, the problem with that is these cloud storage providers, they charge you an egress tax uh, on every time there's data written to their drives and data that is taken out of their storage. So every time that happens, if you have more cash, uh, misses, you're going to have to egress more data out of the origin servers. Every time you do that, um, there's going to be an egress fee associated with each of those functions. And the higher the number of those functions, the reads and writes, the more you're going to have to pay in egress fees. And that's why we call it the, the hidden cost, because this usually cannot be predicted. This usually cannot be calculated when you're signing up for these services. And these fees can really stack up super fast, and it can cost you anywhere between hundreds of thousands of dollars up to millions of dollars per month. So what do we need? What's the solution here? We've talked about a lot of the problems. What is the solution? The solution here is a best of breed solution that can actually complement your existing, if you're using caching, it's, it can complement your existing uh, cache, your tiered cache, and lower your egress fees by improving your cache hit ratios, and then eventually also improving the performance. And that's where uh, Cloudflare cache reserves uh, comes into play, right? So what does cache reserve do? What is it? It's, uh, it's the ultimate upper tier cache that actually caches data for longer. You have the control to cache data for longer, uh, which obviously will improve your cache hit ratios 
for the data that you are keeping there. And it eliminates unnecessary egress. Egresses that you would have to do otherwise, you would just take them out of the equation with cash reserve. And that would all obviously lead to maximizing your savings, reducing your costs, and so on. Now, if we take the picture from the previous slide and add cash reserve to it, now we kind of have two sections of caches over here. The cash reserve is a specialized top tier cache, which will keep data in there based on the time that you select for certain pieces of data. While the tiered caching, it's going to keep data in the cache based on popularity. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. And Homer is going to go into the details of how cache reserve works. So I'm not really going to go into a lot of the detail here, but primarily what it's going to do, once you introduce cache reserve into the mix, you're going to see increased cache hit ratios. And I'm talking about you know moving as close to the 100% cache hit ratio as possible. We have customers who've seen 100% from day one and their traffic just doesn't go back to the origin. So their origins are 100% shielded from all the traffic. Because of that, you're gonna see an improvement, if, an improvement in performance because again, cash is closer to your users. If all your users are doing is going to, if all the, their traffic is going to the cash, uh, to sorry, cash reserve and our tiered cash, it's not going all the way back to the origin wherever it may be. And then the burden is not on you to keep your origins closer to the customers because our CDN and our cash reserve is doing that for you. And eventually, as I mentioned, you know, obviously it's going to maximize your savings. Uh, the most you're going to see in terms of egress fees is when you're taking data out of these cloud storage solutions and putting it on cash reserve, that's going to be that one egress that you make. So you're going to have to pay for that one egress. And once that happens, the data is in cash reserve. It's there for a longer period of time. You can decide how long it stays there. And then based on that, you can just, you know, after that, you don't have to pay any egress fees. You're good to go. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Homer, who can kind of walk us through the details, the technical details, of how everything that I just talked about in like 10 minutes works, and then we'll do a demo. So over to you, Homer. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Babar. Uh, so before I talk specifically about cash reserve, I wanna briefly walk through how easy it is to get going with Cloudflare CDN, uh, the basic traffic flow and some of the capabilities you can leverage. And then what we'll do is we'll introduce cash reserve and see how things change. So first let's talk about how easily you can get started and onboard onto Cloudflare CDN. So from the dashboard, you simply click add site and enter your domain. Cloudflare can automatically import your DNS records from your existing DNS provider. And finally, you're given Cloudflare name servers you can use to change your authoritative DNS. So here you're using Cloudflare DNS as your authoritative DNS and also onboarded onto Cloudflare CDN. Now, if you don't wanna change your primary or authoritative DNS, you can still use Cloudflare CDN by simply doing a partial CNAME setup. So lots of flexibility here. Now, you went from before Cloudflare CDN, where your origin server handled all requests, to Cloudflare CDN, where Cloudflare's global Anycast network ensures that any request is handled by the closest data center. And of course, this inherently comes with a number of benefits, including scale, resiliency, and performance. One global network with every service running on every server in every Cloudflare data center. Edge nodes able to respond with cache content quickly. Hardened Anycast network. So you have that decreased latency bubber mentioned while improving network resiliency, higher availability, and increased security due to the larger surface area for absorbing both legitimate traffic loads and DDoS attacks. You have an enhanced CDN solution with Argo Smart routing and tiered cache and now cache reserve, all of which I'll talk about in a bit and you can easily enable additional services. Uh, Cloudflare provides a host of performance, security, and reliability services, including DNS, DDoS protection, WAF, which all can be easily enabled and uses that same edge architecture. So if we look at the very basics of the traffic flow now, first you have 
the HTTP request, which is made. So the closest data center to the user handles that request. Users HTTP request URL is matched against the list of cacheable file extensions. And if the request matches an extension on the list, Cloudflare serves the resource from cache if present. Second, content is fetched from cache origin. So Cloudflare will examine, it examines its caches in multiple network locations for content and serves it if it's present. Now, if the content is stale in Cloudflare cache, Cloudflare attempts to revalidate the content with the origin before serving the response to the client. And if the resource is not present in the cache, then Cloudflare requests the resource from the origin to fill the cache and the response is then sent to the client who initiated the request. Finally, if cacheable content is cached on the response. So Cloudflare ca Cloudflare's cache logic examines the HTTP response received from the origin and the response is either deemed cacheable and written to disk for use with the next request for the same resource, or the request is deemed uncacheable. So let's take a look at the basic traffic flow with Cloudflare standard caching with no tiered cache or smart routing enabled, which I'll talk about in a minute, okay? So a request comes in to the closest data center to the client. Content is not cached or request is made to the origin server for the content. Now, once the response is received, the data center closest to the client or eyeball caches the content and returns the response. Now on subsequent requests to the data center for the same content, the cache will be checked and cache content returned. So here what I'm doing is I'm enabling Argo tiered cache with within the Cloudflare dashboard. So Argo tiered cache is included for free with every Cloudflare plan. So tiered caching basically divides Cloudflare network of global data centers into a hierarchy of upper tiers and lower tiers. And in order to control bandwidth and number of connections between an origin and Cloudflare, only upper tiers are permitted to request content from an origin and are responsible for distributing that information to the lower tiers. So by enabling tiered cache, Cloudflare dynamically finds the single best upper tier for an origin using Argo performance and routing data. And benefits here obviously include uh, bandwidth efficiency, reduced origin load, and making websites more cost-effective to operate. Now, once Argo tiered cache is enabled, there are multiple topology configurations possible. So smart tiered cache topology is the default and available for free and available for free for all plans. So this is also the recommended for most deployments. It basically instructs Cloudflare to find the single best upper tiers for your origins. Now, generic and custom topologies are only available for enterprise plans. So generic global tier topology balances between cache efficiency and latency and instructs Cloudflare to use all tier one data centers as upper tiers. And then custom tiered cache topology allows customers to set a custom topology that fits specific needs. For example, upper tiers in specific geographic locations that may be serving more customers. So let's take a look at the topology again now here. Uh, again, we have Cloudflare CDN, but now with Argo tiered cache with smart tiered cache topology. So client one sends a request to the closest data center, data center one here. If the content is not cached, the upper tier data center labeled data center three here is checked. If the content is not cached at the upper tier, the upper tier requests the content from the origin. And once the response is returned from the origin, the upper tier caches it and returns the response to the lower tier, which also caches it and returns the response to the client. Now, let's say client two makes the same request for the same content to its closest data center, data center two. If the content is not cached at data center two, similar to prior, the upper tier data center is checked. However, in this case, content was requested prior via client one and the upper tier data center has the content cached and returns the cache content to the lower tier data center, data center two, which in turn caches the content and responds back to the client, decreasing latency, saving bandwidth and load on the server and providing better overall performance. Now, in the next case, in addition to Argo tiered cache with smart uh, tiered cache topology, Argo Smart Routing is also enabled. So Argo Smart Routing is an add-on Cloudflare service that uses optimized routes across the Cloudflare network 
to deliver responses to users more quickly, reliably, and securely. Now, Argo Smart Routing ensures the fastest, most reliable paths are used to route requests to the origin. It's able to accelerate traffic by taking into account real-time data and network intelligence from routing millions of HTTP requests per second. So let's take a look at the traffic flow now. Again, when the client sends a request to the lower tier data center, if the content is not cached, upper tier data center is checked. Same as prior, if the content is not cached at the upper tier, the upper tier requests the content from the origin. And in this case, since Argo, tier, uh, Argo Smart Routing is enabled, the fastest, most reliable route to the origin is used to request the content. And once the response is returned from the origin, the upper tier caches it and returns the response to the lower tier, which also caches it and responds to the client. Okay. So now that we have an understanding of Cloudflare CDN and some of the enhanced capabilities, when does a cache miss occur? Well, we have two scenarios here. First, intentional. Cache TTL expired or content purged. So customers set cache control time to signify when the content is out of date and needs to be revalidated. So once expired, content needs to be revalidated and may need to be pulled from the origin if updated version exists. And customers can purge the content manually anytime also, okay? Second is unintentional. So this is where Cloudflare purged content due to LRU or least recently used algorithm, right? To optimize storage, less frequently accessed content may be purged based on LRU. And this is how long the network wants content to remain cached. Now, this is where Cloudflare Cache Reserve can be useful to further increase cache ratio by automatically storing all cacheable file, files in, uh, into Cloudflare's persistent object storage buckets. Basically, Cache Reserve acts like an ultimate upper tier, and when there's a cache miss, Cloudflare will first check these storage buckets before going to the origin. And you can see here, I have it enabled and I'll walk through this in more detail in the demo. So before we look at uh, the traffic flow changes, let's take a deeper look into how cache reserve works. So Cloudflare R2 object storage handles the complexity of an object storage system using Cloudflare workers and durable objects. Data is stored on R2 using its S3 compatible API. On a cache miss, Cloudflare L7 proxy uh, called Pangora reaches out to the origin for content and writes the response to R2. To avoid latency, this happens while the content continues its trip back to the visitor. Now, inside R2, a worker writes the content to R2's persistent data storage while also keeping track of the important metadata that Pangora sends about the object, like origin headers, freshness values, and retention information. And when the content is then next requested, Pangora looks up where the data is stored in R2 by computing the cache key. And the cache key's hash determines both the object name in R2 and which bucket, uh, which bucket it was written to. And this is important because zone assets are sharded across multiple buckets to distribute load. So once found, Pangora attaches the relevant metadata and sends the content from R2 to the nearest upper tier to be cached, then to the lower tier, and then finally back to the visitor. So now let's take a look at the traffic flow. Again, when the client sends a request to the lower tier data center, if the content is not cached, upper tier data center is checked. This time, however, if the content is not cached at the upper tier, the upper tier checks cache reserve instead of requesting uh, instead of requesting straight from the origin. So if the content is now not present in cache reserve, cache reserve will request it from the origin. And once the response is returned from the origin, cache reserve caches the content while replying to the upper tier, which also caches it and returns the response to the lower tier, which also caches it and then responds to the client. Now, next time the same content is requested, uh, if there's a cache miss at the lower tier, the upper tier data center is checked. Now, if there's a cache miss at the upper tier data center, let's say expired TTL or uh, content has been evicted, cache reserve will be checked. And if the content exists in cache reserve, it will be returned and cached at the upper tier before being returned and cached at the lower tier and then returned to the client. So you can see here how cache reserve acts as that ultimate upper tier 
and minimizes the need to pull from the origin, decreasing unnecessary egress fees. With that, with that, let's uh, go ahead and jump into the demo and see this in action. Okay, so for demonstration purposes, I deployed a site here that's basically a large image and video gallery for uploading and downloading content. Now, again, for demonstration purposes, uh, this website is actually hosted on a third-party cloud. And then I also have automated uh, traffic running to simulator, simulate visitors accessing the site. Now I'm gonna head over to my uh, Cloudflare dashboard here. And you can see here, I have uh, cache reserve enabled and it shows the current amount of data stored in cache reserve, as well as the total aggregate uh, storage used over the specific time period and you also have a view of total cash reserve read and write operations. Now, once enabled, cash reserve will start caching files with a retention period of 30 days, which will be reset on any hits. Customers can also come here and pause using cash reserve, meaning Cloudflare's network will no longer use cash reserve to serve data. So I'm gonna jump over to the overview here and under overview, you can see the overall cache status, including cache content served by Cloudflare and content served by the origin. You can see the vast majority of requests are served by Cloudflare. And if you scroll down here and hover over the cache status here, you can actually see here, we have a 94.55% cache hit ratio, very good. So since I just enabled cache reserve a few days ago, if I scroll up here and say, instead of the last 24 hours, I go back to previous 30 days, we can see that the cash hit ratio was lower at around 80%. So cash reserve really helped us get into that 90% plus ratio closer to that 100% we're seeking, right? So now scrolling down even farther here, um, you can see just general overall caching details, like the most popular content types and what specific content is the most popular. Here on the left, you can also uh, purge the cache. And when you purge the cache, it also purges the content in cache reserve. You can also create page rules here to get more gra granular on uh, specific uh, caching behavior. So I'm gonna click into this uh, page rule and we'll take a deeper look at this. You can see here, I created a page rule uh, that's matching on all requests. And if I click this edit, we can see here, it's matching on all requests uh, with this domain name, right? And I set the caching level here to basically cache everything that's cacheable, but I can also select a different cache level, including bypassing the cache if desired. Now I'm gonna head over to caching and take a look at the caching rules. So under caching rules, I can also create a rule as I did here to override TTLs from cache control headers. So this is done right at the edge and you can see here, if I click into it, all requests to this host name, I've configured as content eligible for caching. And I've overridden the origin TTL, setting it to 12 hours here. With Cloudflare Edge TTL, it makes it very convenient to set TTL in one place for all assets. Now, the last thing I'm gonna show here is I'm gonna head over to my analytics and logs. I'm gonna go over to my logs here. And uh, last thing I wanna show here is you can also log data to external logs and include the cash reserve used field. Uh, that I'm showing here to get more visibility into requests and respective content being served from cash reserve. So pretty cool. You can see a lot of flexibility, a lot of configuration options we uh, provide in details. And uh, you can also log that uh, log and get even more insights. And with that, that's it for the demo. I'll hand it back over to Babur to wrap up and for Q and A. Thanks, Omer. If you can help me with the slides, that would be awesome. Yeah, so now, you know, let's talk about Cloudflare beyond just cache reserve and what we've talked about. Uh, if we go to the next slide, 
one thing I want to talk about is like, it's not just us cooking up stories and showing you, you know, cash reserve and saying that it's going to save you a lot of money. Um, and we're not just coming up with those stats out of thin air. We actually have customers that we've been working with uh, in relation to cash reserve, and they have seen real changes. As I mentioned earlier, you know, some of our customers have gone right up to the 100% mark in terms of cash hit ratios. Um, there was a large online food delivery service that we worked with, and as soon as they enabled cash reserve, they saw a 5% increase, and that was like at the beginning. Uh, this keeps getting better and better as cash uh, reserve keeps you know, adding more data uh, to the cash uh, or to storage. So they saw a 5% uh, improvement in cash hit ratios. And obviously that also translated into savings because they were saving that much on egress from the origins. Similarly, there's a large e-commerce company. They saw huge improvement of 10% in terms of cash hit ratios. And that also directly translated into how much they were spending uh, on egress fees and how much of those costs were cut thanks to cash reserve. Uh, and it also um, you know, improved, uh, drastically improved the performance of a lot of their merchant sites that they were hosting. And then the last one is Anthology, Anthology or Blackboard. You might be familiar with those names. Uh, as soon as they enabled cash reserve, they saw a really big improvement in performance. Um, for both teachers and students that, that were using, um, you know, their services. Um, and they'd already been a customer for our CDN, but then as soon as they enabled cash reserve, uh, they just saw a huge jump in improvement. And they actually cut their costs, egress costs, by about two-thirds, which is a huge number. And as I mentioned, you know, this is, this is right at the beginning when they enable it and they see these immediate effects. Uh, the longer... Cash reserve is on enabled for, and the more data it's storing in, the better these cash hit ratios are going to be. And obviously, it's going to translate directly into savings. Now, if we move to the next, next slide, um, Homer talked a little bit about this, but Cloudflare, uh, one of the key reasons why, uh, or one of the key uh, reasons behind the, the extremely amazing improve, uh, performance that we have is our global network. We have presence in over 285 cities across 100 countries. This includes China. Um, and we are connected directly to uh, more than 11,000 networks, including ISPs, cloud providers, large enterprises, and so on. And because of that connectivity and that, that presence globally uh, across major population centers, that is the reason why you will see a huge imp improvement in performance as soon as you sign up with Cloudflare and as soon as you start using our services. And our network capacity keeps on increasing. Like um, it's at 192 terabits per second right now, but honestly, over the past six months, it has grown by a huge number. And I was looking at some of the numbers for the past couple of years, and it has pretty much doubled over the past couple of years. So this the capacity keeps on growing, the presence keeps on improving, um, and, you know, the more presence we have, the closer we are to the user, the closer we are to the user, the better user experience they're going to have and better performance for your services. And that in part, uh, next slide, please. That is in part also because of the fact that it's not just the global network, but we are running uh, every data center. Uh, we are running every service on every server in every data center. We have the capacity to do that. Uh, and that makes it uh, that makes the Cloudflare network, the global network, so powerful because we can have all the services running as close to you as probably one hop off, and that's just going to make that difference compared to solutions that are going to route your traffic back to um, you know these hubs, and that's also going to create choke points. We don't have those issues. Uh, and then the final slide here is. Uh, these are just some of, this is just a snapshot of some of the services that you can run on top of Cloudflare's global network. Uh, we talked about, we extensively talked about CDN, Argo Smart Routing, DNS, uh, Cash Reserve, for example, today, but that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. If we talk about security, we have application security solutions like WAF, uh, 
uh, bot management, um, page shield, et cetera. We have developer services. Uh, if you want to develop your uh, you know, applications at the edge, we have workers, for example, we have snippets for running small uh, bits of Java, uh, JavaScript. And then we have network services to make sure that all the traffic passing through our networks is doing so at a super optimized level. And then we also have solutions for the zero trust um, solution area as well. So it's a whole package. Once you sign in, it's very easy to um, you know, add services to the Cloudflare uh, solution that you're going to be using and interacting with. And again, Homer showed you just a little bit of the dashboard, but it's super easy to use. It takes a few minutes to get used to, and then you're good to go. And I think that's it for today's presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, there are a bunch of handouts that we've added to this uh, presentation, but if you want to learn more about uh, cash reserves specifically, and how you can improve your cash hit ratios, go to our website and you know, visit our cash reserve product page, learn more about cash reserve by looking at the developer docs page. Uh, that's going to go into a little more detail on the technical side. We have a solution brief that's gonna give you a good overview of some of the benefits that you're gonna get out of cash reserve. And if you feel like it, contact us, set up a demo. We're gonna go, uh, we can do a one-on-one -on -one demo with your organization and help you set up cash reserve and help you save that money. All right, so let's go ahead and start taking on some questions, guys. So the first question that we got was, is this solution available currently? Yes, it is. I'll take that, sorry. Uh, yes, it is. So um, cash reserve has been in open beta since November last year. Uh, so it's been in open beta for the past uh, five, five and a half months, uh, but it is going to go GA in um, in the next month. So yeah, it's it's been available. As I mentioned, you know, we have a lot of active customers using Cash Reserve and taking in all the benefits that Cash Reserve comes with. All right, how can we sign up and, and start using Cash Reserve? So as Homer mentioned, you know, as uh, if if you are a uh, Cloudflare customer, it's as simple as going to that uh, caching tab on the left side and then just going into Cash Reserve and just clicking that one button and that's it. And that's the, the cool thing about Cash Reserve. We've been talking to some of our customers and the thing that they talk the most about is how easy it is. And some people even call it magic. You just press that button and it works. You don't have to do anything in the background. We do that for you. So yeah, it's as simple as just clicking that button to sign up for Cash Reserve. All right, so I know anyone who is interested in this has price at the top of mind. So um, what can you tell us about pricing? Oh, so a lot of the pricing information is available on our website. So the links that I've given you, uh, if you just go over to those links, you're going to see a table of pricing. Uh, there are three costs associated here. We don't believe in charging anyone egress uh, fees, so you're not going to be, you know, looking uh, at those costs added. Obviously, we're going to save you on egress fees rather than charge you. But there is a small cost associated with all the read-write functions uh, with Cash Reserve, and then there's also a storage. So there are different storage tiers that you can purchase, and depending on how much storage you buy, obviously that's the thing that we charge for. All right, so how long does my content stay in the cash reserve? Yeah, so I'll take that one. Uh, so the retention period is 30 days. However, if there's a cash hit, the retention period will be reset. And if the cash control TTL expires, won't the content be purged from the cash reserve? Okay, so yeah, this is a good question. So no, so there, there are two different things, the TTL and then the retention period. So the freshness TTL is different from cash reserve retention period. Cash control headers like freshness TTL uh, will be respected and content will be revalidated to ensure the freshness. But the cash reserve retention period is always 30 days. Uh, and again, it will be reset on a hit. Uh, so you said it's uh, 30 days, but what if I want to change that? Am I able to configure it differently? 
Yeah. So today you can't, uh, you can't change it. It's uh, 30 days is set, but when a, when cash reserve is used or when there's a hit that counter or that period will basically be reset to 30 days. Alrighty. Um, so how many times can I, or how can I see how many times cash reserve has been used to serve content? Is that, is that tracked? Yeah. So if you remember like in the demo, when I first went into the cash reserve, uh, under the cash reserve tab, you can see the total number of cash reserve read operations. Awesome. Awesome. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, let's see. Sorting through more questions. Uh, how can I see specific files served from cash reserve? Okay. So you can, if you remember at the end of the demo where I was showing how you can log we have that login capability and you can add that specific field for cash reserve views. So that can actually be used to show um, which request content were served from cash reserve. And then we're also planning additional capabilities here in the future. All right. And what do I do if the content stored in the cash reserve isn't the most up-to-date content? It's not the latest. Okay. Yeah. So I kind of, uh, I referenced this prior, uh, but cache control headers like the Freshen TTL, they'll be respected, and then cache reserve will be will revalidate that content to ensure freshness, respecting those TTL. All right, and it looks like we are we're running low on questions. So if anyone in the audience does have questions, go ahead and send those in to us in the Q and A. We will try to get to them. Um, so our next question reads, how can you delete content from cash reserve? Yeah, uh, good question. So uh, the purge capability that we have with our CDN where it purges all the content in the cache, when you do a purge, it'll also purge all the cash reserve content. Perfect. Um, so while we wait on just a couple of couple more questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and remind everyone that our session today was recorded. If you want to rewatch this, you will be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand. Or of course, you can find it living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars. And be sure to look in the on demand section. And I'll also point out to everyone that, uh, or rather, I'd like to announce the four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing. Our four winners are Andrea S, Leonard S, Ajit B, and Gordon A. So to our four winners, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. If you don't happen to see that email, check your spam folder just in case it got filtered out. All right, well, I'm, I'm it's looking like we've pretty much squashed all these questions, guys. So I do wanna kind of go around the table, give each of you the opportunity to leave our audience with any closing remarks or anything you feel they, they absolutely need to pull away from this program. Bob, you wanna get that kicked off? Sure. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, egress fees, uh, to me, they feel like an unnecessary cost. Uh, and again, a lot of the times these costs do kind of get lost in the calculations and they can hurt you in the long run. Uh, so if you are and, and in today's day and age with, with the economic climate that we're seeing right now, every penny, every dollar that's saved is going to save you big time. So yeah, do consider solutions like cash reserve. Uh, do consider cash reserve as the main solution here. And, you know, just check it out, reach out to us. And if you if you feel like this is the solution for us, we can work with that. And yeah, uh, you're going to see immediate savings. So who doesn't like that, right? <laughs> awesome. Humer, anything to add on your side? Yeah, no, I, I concur with uh, Bubber. I think he covered it uh, pretty well. You know, Cloudflare, we're, we're a company, we we don't inherently believe in these egress fees. It's just, you know, unnecessary costs. And this is a perfect solution uh, for you to you know, get uh, kind of, you know, result, deal with that issue, right? And if you already have Cloudflare, you know, it's as, as simple as clicking a button. If you're already using Cloudflare, go ahead and give it a try and uh, reach out to us if you have any questions. Awesome. Bobber and Humair, thank you both so much for joining me today. It was such a pleasure getting to know you before we went live today. Um, I do just want to um, also give a shout out to Cloudflare for sponsoring our program. We couldn't have carried this on without the their support. 
and to our audience who's been with us for the last hour, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you spending time with us and sending in your questions, your chats. Um, we do just want to steal one more moment of your time for a survey that will pop up on your screen as soon as we close out. Feel free to give us your feedback. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's program or maybe what you'd like to hear on an upcoming program. Either way, we do hope to see everyone at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day. And Faber, Humer, thank you both so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.